Dear friends, fellow attendees and esteemed guests of the Pan IIT World of Technology 2021 Summit, welcome to the quantum computing session. The quantum computing power and speed will help us solve some of the biggest and most complex challenges we face as humans using the quantum supremacy. High tech companies have been heavily investing to commercialize quantum technology. We have seen successes like installing quantum processors on silicon chips and making it available on cloud platforms for developers and programmers. The use of quantum devices to simulate quantum chemistry is much more efficient than the use of the fastest classical supercomputers of today. Quantum computing is projected to transform every sector imaginable, from healthcare and security to energy and finance, as this cutting edge technology is faster and much more efficient than the classical supercomputers of today. For today's session, let me welcome the person who will be moderating the entire panel discussion, Mr. Jaiji Bhattacharya, who is the founder and CEO of Xeron Microsystems Private Limited and the president for the Center of Digital Economy Policy Research and an adjunct professor at IIT Delhi. He has been responsible for the creation of the next generation of solutions for governments based on open standards. He advises governments on e-governance strategies and is an advisor to the government of Sri Lanka and government of West Bengal on e-governance and ICT policy. He has helped the World Bank develop curriculum for their e-leadership program. Please join me in welcoming the moderator for the quantum computing panel discussion, Mr. Jaijit Bhattacharya. Over to you. Thank you, Pityut. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm quite excited to be part of this uh, panel conversation. Um, so welcome everyone to the quantum computing session. Uh, we have a brilliant set of, uh, of, of speakers today as part of the panel, and I'm looking forward to hear to, from them. And as Pityut said, uh, that quantum will be transformational and it will not just be transformational, it actually will be disruptive. There will be entire industries which will get disrupted because of quantum, their existing processes will get def, uh, will get uh, disrupted. In fact, anything which is digital will get disrupted by quantum. That's the kind of uh, uh, of impact that quantum and quantum computing will be having in the next five to ten years. And for us to understand how the disruption will happen, what is quantum computing, and how will India play a role in it? What are the hindrances? We have with us an absolutely stellar set of people which um, you know, Kamlesh from Pan IIT had helped us put together. So I'll um, go ahead and introduce the, panel, the panelists that we have today. We have Dr. Sesha Raghunathan, who is uh, a quantum distinguished ambassador of IBM. Uh, we have Professor Shohini Ghosh, who is a professor at Wilford Laurier University at Canada. Professor Arindam Ghosh, who is, the, who is a professor at ISC, and he's also one of the co-architects of the 8,000 crore quantum computing plan that government of India has put together. We also have Dr. Amlan Mukherjee, who is director at uh, QPI AI, which is one of the pioneers of quantum computing in India. Welcome, um, all of you. Um, with that, I would actually start with uh, Dr. Sesha Raghunathan and request him to walk us through what is quantum computing all about? What is the technology? What's the mystery around it? And what does it really solve? So, Sesha, over to you. Hey, uh, thanks, Jagjit, uh, and thanks for Pan IIT for inviting me here. Uh, I'll just give a very, very high-level overview of what this technology is and just to make sense of why it is different. Um, as you all know, uh, at a very basic level, the classical hardware, the basic element is called a binary digit or a bit. Uh, that binary element, uh, as the name suggests, has two states in it, zero or a one. So uh, either it is zero or it is a one through the compute uh, in the com uh, classical hardware at any given point in time, uh, the value on a given uh, signal will always be either zero or a one. Uh, so it is deterministic. In quantum, however, the fundamental element is called a qubit or a quantum bit. Much like its classical counterpart, it is a two level system. However, where the difference comes is the states are not limited to just zero and one only. It can be in a combination of zero and one in a probabilistic sense. 
uh, in that sense quantum computing um, uh, the fundamental element in quantum computing the quantum bit is very different from the classical bit and it is fundamentally probabilistic and it uh, uh, it it is built on top of the principles of quantum physics uh, as against the classical which is boolean logic and uh, probably classical physics so here what it does is the value proposition is it leverages some of the basic principles of quantum physics especially entanglement uh, that is not available in a classical uh, hardware or classical physics and that's what it provides value on uh, so if you see this picture here uh, you have a zero and one the north pole and the south pole uh, you can imagine in uh, imagine a sphere and uh, the state any anything in this sphere is a legitimate state uh, what it tells you is say for example if i were in a northern hemisphere somewhere the probability of getting zero is higher compared to probability of getting one and so forth the manipulation happens in this probabilistic space um, with ex uh, extra amount of additional states that are available which are the entangled states just to give you a sense of power uh, so if i were to do the simulation of a uh, class quantum computer in a classical hardware or a classical computer um, if you want to keep track of how many bits would i need to do the simulation correctly uh, look at the scaling on the left is the qubit on the right is number of bits you need in a classical hardware to keep track of all the interactions uh, that are out there so what you see is that scaling on the right goes exponentially and scaling on the left is linear so what it gives you is essentially exponential state space to play with and the kind of problems that can leverage that state space efficiently to solve the problem at hand uh, is the game that we play here so take any particular problem that is typically hard to do classically see if you can map it into something in that exponential state space where you leverage this exponential state space do the transformation in this exponential state space and get the answer out and anything that can map into this kind of a framework can potentially leverage the power of quantum computing so let me stop there with that i'll prove i'll move to um uh, to uh, professor uh, shohini uh shohini um, could you help us understand what are the business implications what are the usages of this technology how does it help in the real world sure i'll do my best it's um it's a very different approach of course to computing and this is because it's not just that we're building that one you know faster chip you know how every year you hear oh there's a better chip and you got to go upgrade your laptop or whatever that's not what we're talking about we're talking about rethinking the both the mathematical framework of computing itself and th therefore rethinking how this larger framework the larger toolbox can allow us to do problems that perhaps we are not so great at doing with our current next generation you know chip or um, next generation laptop we have today so um what what that means is not only can we do perhaps some of our existing tasks faster but maybe we can do even new things that uh, are just outside the scope of current computers um but i also want to step back and say that this doesn't mean that everything that our current computers can do will somehow be less efficient compared to a quantum computer that's not actually true in fact we only know of very specific types of problems so far where potentially a quantum computer that is large scale could help and um i uh, so for example using this kind of mathematical um, framework one of the algorithms that was originally developed that got everybody excited that um really kick started the whole area because it was much much faster than any existing known algorithm is to calculate the prime factors of a very large number which doesn't sound like such a cool thing to do but it is incredibly important because every single encryption system that we use around the world almost every one of them has been standardized to use this factoring problem for encryption because in fact it's a very hard problem for current computers to solve which means it's it's hard for hackers to solve is the idea but now if you have a new algorithm that can actually do this problem quickly then that means whoever has that quantum computer that can apply this new quantum algorithm will have a lot of additional power in many senses 
So that's, a, for example, an application which crosses many, many boundaries. Not only can you think about doing, you know, um, encryption of this kind can be, uh, can be applied, whether we're talking about keeping our financial records safe or talking about, um, you know, healthcare data or anything where there's any kind of, um, you know, security question. That's, of course, a huge area which has really driven the field initially. But I also want to mention that that's on the computing side. There's also a lot of potential of using this broader framework of thinking about information itself, as you heard, is more than just zeros and ones. You can think about this probabilistic type of information, which sounds like it would be you know, less precise. But sometimes less precise is actually powerful. For example, if you want to hide data, so using quantum means you could communicate, for example, in ways that could perhaps be more, more secure, more efficient, perhaps more anonymous, depending on the needs of your communications network. You can use quantum approaches uh, in ways that would uh, not be possible with what we have today. So the focus on quantum communications, building, you know, even satellite-based quantum networks may be the the foundations for potentially a new quantum internet. So those are a couple of applications. There's a, a couple more that I want to just mention very briefly, and maybe we can discuss it more later, is uh, in the field of uh, sensing and imaging, because there too, these new quantum properties such as entanglement turn out to be like this uh, extra fuel that you can apply to try to improve your resolution of your imaging and, you know, and just just do things in different areas, whether we're talking about healthcare imaging or you know seeing the stars better. There's many many different applications of imaging, and the fourth super important example, perhaps the most important these days, given that we're in the middle of this current pandemic, is to use quantum computers for designing different types of molecules and studying them. Quantum chemistry is what we're talking about. Quantum simulations, and the reason that's so relevant is because that could help with things like drug development and uh, even things like vaccines and so on. So yeah, there's a huge potential. It's, it's not infinite and it's not magic. And there's huge challenges to actually build the hardware. But if we can make small steps, there's a lot of power there. Very interesting, Shoini. And um, based on what you're telling us, Shoini, my understanding is that it'll have deep implications, both in terms of creating new solutions as well as making existing solutions redundant. Um, for example, uh, most of the, the solutions of the banking industry will become redundant because now their encryptions can be broken extremely easily. So therefore, quantum also seems to have a strategic implication for any country. Uh, and with that, I'll come to Professor Arindam Ghosh. Um, uh, Arindam, um, what is India really doing in the area of quantum computing? And uh, where, what's the role of IS in that? Because uh, you have been one of the co-architects of the 8,000 crore plan. So what does the plan envision? Where, what, what does India plan to do? Right. Thanks, Jayajit. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with such stellar participants. Um, so, well, 8,000 crore uh, you know, announcement from the finance minister came in 2019. But uh, the government's uh, push towards making quantum computation a reality actually started a little earlier. If you look at 2017, there was an announcement uh, from the Department of Science and Technology on the Quest program, which is called Quantum Enabled Science and uh, Technology, which is about $50 million uh, or so on. Uh, but after that, there are several other government agencies uh, picked up the um, thread and continued. For example, the uh, Ministry of Information, uh, you know, um, the electronics and information technology, MIT, uh, invested quite a bit of money uh, and uh, created a multi-institutional conglomerate, like including IISC, Raman Research Institute, and there are some of them MIT labs. And uh, the goal there was to create a small quantum processor, about eight or uh, eight qubit or so, within a couple of years or so. This is we are talking about a much smaller section of people, uh, and hence the goals need, needed to be kept realistic. Uh, following that, about in 2019, there was this uh, uh, announcement of 8,000 crore, about a billion dollar, 1.2 billion dollar um, of the national mission on quantum 
technology. It's not just quantum computation, it's quantum technology, uh, which was supposed to be then created through several, uh, a complete structure of, uh, you know, dedicated towards quantum computation, quantum material, uh, quantum communication, quantum uh, sensing and metrology, and also quantum materials and devices. There are four verticals under this entire quantum mission. Each of these missions, uh, each of these verticals would have its own structure. For example, uh, it will have a research and um, component of fundamental research needs to be done in all these because without fundamental research, one of the key aspects of quantum technology, computation, communication, everything is that the science is still evolving. It's not completely at its finality, unlike many of the semiconductor processes. So you've got to have a very strong research component here. And uh, but the again, an interesting aspect is that even with the current state of research, you should be able to have a societal impact with quantum technology and then increase it in, in or, or enhance it as the research progresses. So with that also, the technology development it becomes another uh, component of each of these verticals or four verticals that I talked about. Uh, then we have quantum infrastructure building is also a big part of this national mission because as you know about semiconductor has been a big problem in India because we do not have a back-end electronics. If you want to make a quantum processor in India today, you need to have a back-end electronics which needs to be built in from China or some Taiwan or someone else. So we need to solve that problem. We need to solve that entire chain to be in country rather than going outside and import that. So we need to create an infrastructure for the peripherals, the electronics, uh, you know, and uh, other uh, necessary ecosystem. Uh, and industry ecosystem is also an important part of this. Industry must, must be continuously in, engaged, including startups and bigger industries who are investing in quantum computation in a big way. Uh, and finally, teaching and creating human resources. Um, in that sense, I will, by at the end of my two or three minutes, I will tell you what ISC is doing. And this is one, one of the major programs in ISC now. So the overall, the research will be basic and applied research under national mission. There will be translational research, which will be looking at taking that basic research and taking into the, uh, in, in implementing it in actual prototypes and devices. And there's also something called a directed research, which will be primarily coming from uh, strategic industries like DRDO, like MITE, like uh, BAE, uh, where there would be a necessary uh, deployment of the research on quantum technologies, which will be required for strategic purposes. And hence, uh, we need to uh, look at these three different directions. Um, the projects, uh, this is just how we hope the NMQTA will work, uh, this National Mission of Quantum Technology and Applications. It will be at the individual level, individual faculty members, individual uh, people will be able to get projects and do the research. There would be cluster level in which there will be a collection of faculty members, collection of faculty plus industry coming in to play in that uh, to create a bigger goal and more realistic goal that will be also be hopefully funded. Uh, then we'll create central facilities. The central facilities will be created, will be used by both individual and cluster. Uh, level, you know, consortia. Uh, high-end fabrication facilities should be built up. We'll have material growth facilities and high-end testing and calibration facilities. If you are looking at quantum computation or you are looking at uh, communication or sensing, anything. Um, what we would really look for is a joint facility with industries. And this is something which hopefully will work out if uh, this mission uh, somehow um, you know, comes to reality, hopefully soon. Okay, so that's overall the structure in which this uh, whole thing uh, has been planned. I can tell you that the, 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 the goals of the mission is at par with the world in terms of the number of qubits we would like to have at the end of five years, initially it will be five years. Uh, the, the, the networking of the, whether it's a high altitude communication or ground communication, there would be uh, networks, so the kind of sensing that we're looking for, the magnetic sensing, the electric field sensing, these are all at par with the global standards today. 
So hopefully once this, this mission is underway, we will have a very strong connection between faculty and industry to look at the best deliverable that we can think of. Finally, about IAC, the way IAC is, is uh, getting engaged with this overall global and national uh, mission, we have started what you call an Insti Indian Institute of Science Quantum Technology Initiative, IQTI, where there are about 40 odd faculty members have come together from various different, 11 different departments. One of the key strength of IAC is got, it has got about 40 odd departments covering entire spectrum of science and engineering and mathematics, you know, I mean, so we wanted to, because quantum technology is such an interdisciplinary science, it's a perfect, uh, you know, platform in which we can have this interdisciplinarity coming in. And we have uh, started as our initial, we have started getting funding from Mighty, for example, that was the initial one. But then we are also now looking at various other forums, hopefully when the and then QTA comes through, we will we'll also collaborate with others and, and create centers of excellence here. Uh, but in order to get started, we have started the country's first MTech program with uh, entirely dedicated to the quantum uh, technology in which uh, we have started a small number of 10 students because this was the first program and I'm hoping it will become very popular and we'll expand it very soon in the coming years. Uh, the goal is to train students in all aspects of quantum technology, both theoretical and experimental aspects, in which uh, quantum computation, quantum information and communication, quantum sensing materials, everything will be given at the core level. And then the students can choose what they go to, whether it is theoretical or experimental, and hopefully uh, specialize in something and then get it absorbed in industry, both in India and abroad. Um, so that's the goal. That's how we believe that it will happen. There's a, this will get integrated to the bigger goal of national mission as well. And uh, we are quite happy to see there's a lot of industry now who are interested in the students and getting the students to internship, for example. Okay. So this is where I am. Thank you. Yeah, right. No, thank you so much. Uh, and I think um, that brings me to Amlan because um, his company, the QPI AI, is uh, one of the pioneers in quantum anywhere in the world and has benefited from uh, the support of ISSC. So Amlan, over to you in terms of what are the challenges that a startup such as yours are facing and uh, what are the pioneering steps that you have taken to leverage uh, a new technology such as quantum? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. First of all, this is Amlan here. So I am representing the company called QPI AI. So we are an uh, Indian startup. So essentially, we uh, sell AI solutions, we sell uh, quantum hardware solutions and quantum software solutions, the full stack quantum and also AI solutions. So uh, as, as Professor Arindam Ghosh already uh, told us, uh, I'm, I'm, first of all, I want to be thankful for, to Professor Arindam and uh, IASD for supporting us as an Indian startup. So this was really a great help for us and it is, uh, IASD has extended help in many facets to us. That is, I want to acknowledge that. But yes, exactly the problem we are trying to solve in a very near term, in a really realistic way, is to provide hardware support to quantum technologies. Let's say you have qubits, but you want to control your qubits. The electronics will, will developing the electronics, both at room temperature and at cryogenic temperature. And we'll also have the software to run it. So it's a full stack. It all will be coherent. That's the solution we are trying to uh, give. Currently, what uh, that's that's a bit in future. Let's say in uh, two years, you will have this complete solution. Hardware in one year, software in one year, but the complete solution will come in like two years. So uh, this is current state. But when we run as a startup, so we have to really right now survive on the fact that you know we are in the Indian ecosystem. When we try to see the support that we get from IS is fine, but from the government, for example, is I think a bit lacking in a sense that um, there is, I see uh, news of 8,000 crore uh, money, uh, the national quantum mission coming up, but how do I access those grants? Can I have a channel through which I can access those grants? This is, I, am, I have very little knowledge of that. And when I ask people uh, uh, and, and say, how can I access it? It seems it's not so easy and straightforward to access those grants for an Indian startup as an industry. So, of course, we are open for collaborations and we are really hoping that this will uh, stand out fine. 
but yeah we, we we see a lot of challenges being in india also the fact that uh, what what i see lacking is the fact uh, the government do not come out with uh, let's say a need for quantum technology or let's say they can have a proposal that yes we want to develop quantum technology or i need a quantum solution for example as an experimental way to uh, judge that quantum solutions are fit for future or not i don't see government participation as a market so i don't see government as a market for me so right now what we are trying to do we are we actually serving the globe so we, our customers are uh, are people who want quantum computing on the campus for example big fortune 500 company so they they don't want to share data with other fortune 500 company so maybe another fortune 500 company has a quantum computer they want to want to use it because they don't want the data to be transferred there so we are developing quantum computers for them uh our our we are also selling software solutions for example optimization problem which uh, i think uh, professor shweli already uh, told you about source algorithm the one that can crack uh, you know prime number and uh, rsa or encryption uh, we are interested in that the next most famous algorithm was given by actually an indian physicist uh, indian computer scientist uh, love kumar grover grover's algorithm this is uh, a search algorithm which is quite unique and it is really different from all the classical computational and uh, you know classical computer search algorithm that we know this uses really uh, power of superposition and uh, you know other things uh, uh, interference and everything to actually help us search a very different kind of a book it's like reading the book in one go and get uh, exactly the thing you want at one at once so that is uh, there's a power of quantum computation so we're using such algorithms such uh, quantum inspired algorithms in near term and we are selling those solutions to international people in there are groups outside india uh, big companies who are buying this however i don't see the same demand from indian industry this is where i see there is also a lack of uh, in, you know uh, education uh, education among the indian industries that how they can use it for their uh, uh, you know benefit how quantum computation can be used for their uh, you know enterprise in this regard we have uh, launched a course again with collaboration with iisc both on ai and quantum so we have we are running a, a educational course a certificate course which any executive can take up our also students can take up we have students discounts and all this thing but uh, so essentially it's in both ai and quantum and again in collaboration with iisc we have launched a educational course so you are uh, please uh, check this name qpi ai i see and i will get uh, such things more information about it so that is what i i think i think government uh, should get in, involved in buying solutions or providing like what is the requirement from let's say what is the exact requirement for rbi what is the exact requirement for drdo we can serve as an indian startup we can serve that so uh, Mulan, uh, great uh, i think the takeaway uh, that i have from what you are what you has mentioned is that you expect the government to actually create the market right and i think uh, that's how all other governments uh, globally have been getting into new technologies by actually creating the market for those technologies um so with that i'll move on with uh, some fundamental questions that have come from the delegates and uh, i'll direct that to sesha um and the question is how does one make a qubit mode and how can a bit uh, be uh, be in a super uh, position um so sesha that's a question that has come in i'm not able to make out the second part of the question in that sense but maybe you can understand what the intent of the question is right so um, first is uh, there are many physical realizations that are out there um two most popular ones at this time uh, is uh, superconducting qubit based technology and ion trap based technology but that's those are not the limited ones there are many many approaches uh, including semiconductor photonics and so forth um but in principle all of them have the similar mechanics so i will explain in the context of superconducting qubit technology which is what ibm uses but in principle similar thing gets translated into different um, physical realizations so what uh, superconducting qubit does is uh, it is um, Uh, it leverages a certain uh, it operates at a um, uh, at a cryogenic level it's 10 10 to 15 millikelvin uh, temperature and leverages naturally the superconducting uh, part of uh, 
element. It has an essentially an anharmonic uh, oscillator. That's what it comes to. Essentially, if you have an LC loop, you will get an anharmonic oscillator. So you get different energy levels. So what we use in that different energy levels are the two, uh, the ground state and the first excited state. Those are the two levels that we use as qubit um, state zero and state one. Then the aspect of quantum physics kicks in. Once you have quantum properties available and you do quantum interactions with the physical system, um, then the rotation in that space, zero and one that I showed you, the sphere that I showed you, is nothing but a rotation. So what is the um, signal that you apply on the system, on the physical system, that makes it rotate? So based on the Hamiltonian that you choose, basically it will do certain rotation. By rotation, it's in the probabilistic space that I'm talking about, in what combination of zero and one it is. Physically, what that means in superconducting qubit is you essentially send a microwave signal. A qubit is, um, in our case, it's also semiconductor based. It's etched in a particular thing in the chip. You have uh, a waveguide connect, wave connecting to it, uh, the input and the output. What you do is send a wave, um, uh, send a microwave signal into it. And naturally, micro any signal that you send has amplitude, frequency, um, and the phase. So based on what you want to do, say you want to take a uh, qubit is in uh, say state zero, and you want to get it to equator, right? Then that's a signal that you do send, uh, a microwave signal that you send that takes you from zero, uh, the North Pole to an equator perhaps, or any other state. So it's based on the signal that you send, the microwave signal going, hitting the uh, particular qubit, and based on which the transformation happens, uh, it rotates uh, in the probabilistic space. And that's how the qubit gate gets implemented. A two qubit gate is a little bit more interesting. Um, uh, there, what you do is um, you have a coupling waveguide between one qubit and the other qubit, which is always on in our case. Um, so what it does, and it is tuned to a certain frequency. So you send it at a higher frequency and the detuning is what causes it to interact with the other one. And that interaction leads to a, a conditional rotation on the other one based on the value in the first one. That's how that gets implemented. And the frequency of operation in superconducting qubit is in the order of uh, anywhere between five to 10 gigahertz range. Um, and these signals, uh, the micro signals that go in are in that frequency range. So it is frequency dependent. Uh, you have a specific frequency to make it talk to different qubits that you may have. And uh, you use the frequency and the microwave signal to make the necessary rotation. Great, uh, Sisha. I think that uh, brings in absolute clarity. Thank you so much uh, for making it that lucid. Um, with that, I'll move to uh, Shoini. Um, Shoini, can you give us a view of what's happening in Canada and how's, how's Canada and the, and, and the Western nations looking at quantum computing? What are the steps they are taking and how they are encouraging a, a wider adoption of uh, quantum computing and a wider development of capabilities in uh, quantum computing? Sure. So um, Canada has been involved in developing quantum computing, quantum information technology for quite a while now, because one of the very first uh, applications that was pointed out actually back in the 80s, which you know doesn't sound that far uh, back, but so much has happened since then that um, it's, it's become almost the history of quantum information. And this was a, a particular um, insight that uh, this idea of quantum superpositions and quantum bits, uncertainty, and harnessing these new aspects to do information processing, and especially in a, a particular type of uh, communication that is uh, completely unhackable. This was an algorithm that was developed by these two scientists. One of them was uh, Charlie Bennett at IBM. And the other one is Gilles Brassard, who is a professor in uh, Montreal in Canada. So because of that sort of early uh, stage involvement from uh, in Canada, that has led to quite a long history of developing these kinds of ideas. And that has, uh, and now there's this huge hub uh, where I'm based, which is at Waterloo, Canada, which is about an hour from Toronto. Toronto also is another base. And there's um, also clusters across the country now of research groups, as well as uh, smaller startups. And of course, larger companies such as IBM 
and others who are developing quantum technologies in Canada. And what's interesting is that this has gone hand in hand with uh, the other major technology that has taken off, which is AI. And Canada has also been involved in the AI game for quite a while, again, taking the sort of long term approach of funding the basic research initially. Back in the days when nobody even, you know, really talked about things like machine learning, that was when Canada was already putting funding behind this. So it was all about trying to, uh, to uh, develop an infrastructure of uh, supporting what we call curiosity based research rather than application-based research. So I think that's a little bit different and Canada still has that as a major focus. So the national um, government uh, major science funding program is still based on mostly uh, the curiosity-driven research. And now there's also more of the applied research to go hand in hand with that. And then very recently, there has been a major announcement in the last budget, federal budget also of a large funding, uh, I believe it's around 600 million uh, Canadian. So about how I'd say 500, probably uh, 500 million US dollars, which uh, is, uh, is smaller than let's say the Indian uh, funding announcement. But of course, per capita in Canada, it's, it's, it's actually quite a large amount. So that is now being uh, similarly translated to try to support research across the country there it is administered through uh, the, the department of science and innovation and technology and that department is developing a committee and you know making the planning so that part is pretty similar to sorry, what's happening in india question. sorry a quick question on that are these funds open to non-canadians <laughs> through collaborations absolutely so <laughs> i think that you do have to have a canadian based researcher or team or a startup but it is not strictly so, only for us. So you do have a bunch of uh, options to collaborate in this panel. Um, I'm sure they'll be <laughs> happy to, to, to collaborate to yeah. the funds. In the interest of time, I'll move on uh, because we are almost uh, uh, done with the time limit that we had. So I'll move to Professor Ghosh, uh, Arindam Ghosh. Uh, there is a question that's coming from the delegates that are the infrastructure and facilities available for quantum computing facilities accessible to people working in all institutions. And with that, I'll add the larger question that how can we move towards democratization of access to quantum technologies? Well, answer is absolutely yes. Uh, any, in, any infrastructure built with the, you know, in this national mission is a property of the nation and it will have to be accessible and it will be accessible to any institution in the country. Now, the question is that when you say institution, if you're talking about academic institution or industrial bodies, so one has uh, various slabs in which one is, needs to look at. And um, for there, there are uh, policies in which these will become available. And for academic institution, for carrying out research and development, this is certainly true, that they will all be available. Uh, probably there will have to be projects with industry and these institutions infrastructure will then be available to other uh, industrial and corporate bodies as well. Uh, so that needs to be discussed. That needs to be decided later. Uh, but in addition to that, there are also uh, various agencies which are tying up with uh, different corporates like IBM like uh, to get uh, cloud access for quantum. Uh, computations and for that also should be available to the institutions to do, uh, you know, uh, you know, play around with the qubits, for example. So that should be available for, to all institutions already. Uh, now, democratization of the resources, again, uh, it should be available. Anyone who has a good idea of any aspect of quantum technology should now be able to do research even if they do not have an infrastructure at their host institution. That is the most important aim of this national mission. So I hope that that would be leading to democratic democratization and human resource development. We are also thinking of having online courses uh, to be available to students from any part of India on quantum technologies and see that they, they get trained 
with the different aspects or different verticals of quantum technology and including quantum computation. So I hope that in next few years, five years, uh, once the mission starts, uh, we will have a large body of academia and industry coming together and, and from all parts of India um, to take advantage of the developments of this field. I think that's very heartening to hear. Uh, I'll move to Omlan, and that's really a last question in today's uh, session because we have completely run out of time. Um, uh, Omlan, um, there, there are so many public um, support systems available in quantum uh, that we hear of uh, support from ISC. Uh, and in a separate conversation with Sasha, he told me about the open source repositories for quantum computing that IBM uh, has put out there. Uh, and there is access to quantum computing through the cloud. Um, how does a startup like yours leverage all of this? And what's your advice to others who may follow your footsteps and get into the quantum computing world? Yeah, great, great question. That is a very nice and a really apt question here. Uh, so I would begin with saying that where quantum computation can help. We just said that this is a remarkable technology, but where it can help. I would say logistics, like uh, traveling sales science problem, you can optimize your logistics, you can opti optimize uh, work ledgers, uh, there's so entire optimization part. Then you can go for pharma, uh, for example, design drug designing. And then you can go for financial services. For example, you need, uh, again, optimization, uh, portfolio optimization. And then security, when you need another kind, the quantum computer can actually break the classical security. On the other hand, quantum uh, secure networks, the QKD, for example, can secure your quantum net, uh, your network and, and start an era of quantum internet. So this is also coming. So this is where you can all, one can also get help. So right now in India, the field is quite open. There are very few startups. From industry point of view, there are very few involvement. Right now, the idea is that people should know or, or get educated them, get them educated about what is quantum, how it can help their businesses to grow. And I think that is if, if, if India doesn't prepare from the larger perspective in terms of human resource uh, about it, then we are going to miss the bus and we don't want to do that. So that is, uh, that's the idea here. So. Yeah, unfortunately, we do have a bad habit of missing the bus or um, falling before the bus. <clears throat> um, I think um, it's been an excellent session, at least for me. Uh, there's a lot of things that I learned from this session. Uh, I'll just check if there's any questions, further questions from the delegates. So we can probably take one or two questions. Um, Bidhi, if you could just let me know if there are any, any further questions or Kamlesh, if you could let me know if there are any further questions. So, so there seems just, uh, if there is, I would like to make a couple of points if there is time. Uh, Sushab, uh, perhaps you can take a minute or so. Yes, please. Right. So uh, I think uh, a few points in the Indian context. Um, one is, uh, Professor Arindam uh, mentioned this, uh, courses, uh, there is a wide interest um, on the ground. Uh, IBM, along with IIT Madras, we are currently offering an NPTEL course. It's an e-learning course on quantum computing, very basic internet, and there are over 10,000 people registered for that, uh, for that course. And it's live right now. Um, and I've interacted with a lot of students. Uh, at the base level, there is a lot of interest. There is a lot of interest to get engaged in this technology. People are interested. People see that this can potentially lead to a more, um, uh, a more fruitful career path as they progress along the way. Um, what currently, and, and also on the institutional academic sense, there is an understanding, there is an implicit feel. Everybody wants to offer a course on this because they see this technology coming in the horizon. Uh, advanced courses like what ISC is doing in masters is one part of it. Um, IIT Madras also has an integrated master's um, program with uh, quantum um, in the master's level. Um, many, many uh, institutes are now considering doing this kind of course. At the very least, offer courses on quantum computing, uh, even if not a quantum information science as a degree. Uh, there, um, I think there is a groundswell of interest. The students want it. We need to provide avenues to make that happen. The institutes, as well as any other uh, 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 like certificate program, there are many ways 
uh, to go about it. Sure. Uh, so, sorry to uh, you know uh, cut you off in this. I think it's, it's quite interesting, but unfortunately, I'm being told that we're completely run out of time. So perhaps, Sesha, could you possibly share a contact of yours where those who are interested can reach out? Uh, because even I would like to go through one of these courses. Um, so maybe you can put your email and uh, people can reach out to you. Sure. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you wow. can uh, just uh, message me and uh, I'll respond accordingly. Great. Thank you so much, Sesha. And thanks um, uh, to each of my panelists, uh, Professor Arindam Ghosh, uh, Amlan, uh, Professor Shoini Ghosh, uh, and uh, Sesha Raghunathan. Uh, it's been an absolutely scintillating panel discussion. And I would really like to thank you and the organizers uh, and Kamlesh uh, and Vidyut who have been uh, in the back end putting this uh, event together and putting such a terrific panel together. Thank you all. Hope it was interesting for all of you.